so have you all solved the problem that we had kept for working out later in the last class arvind Arvind, you have solved it. Okay. Fine. Anyone else? Anyone else has tried solving it? Okay, do you want me to show the um, So do you want me to show the solution for the same? Yes. okay so so we will look into the solution okay and uh, we will try and understand as to how this problem is solved So you are all able to see the screen? Yes. Is the screen visible? Not so I cannot see the screen. Not yet. No, sir. Now is it visible? Yes, sir. I think I will not be having other issues. Yes, sir. Now it's visible. Okay. It is good also. Fine. So, you know, this was the problem that uh, we were discussing yesterday. And uh, we had actually started off you know with uh, the problems based on orbit perturbations okay and we have to calculate the semi major axis of an orbit uh, having the period of about 12 hours okay so which means t t is given here which is 12 fine 
so i have the formula the mean motion n is equal to 2 pi by t okay pi is a constant t is given right so i get the value here and using my kepler's third law i have this um, you know formula where a cube is equal to mu divided by n square okay. so we will solve for a is equal to 26610 So using this formula, okay, using this formula, we can actually find out. Now, say for example, if A is equal to so much, okay, so you can take that as an example or as a problem and try and uh, solve it, okay. So that should be. Yeah. So n is equal to two pi by t. Yes. So this is my final value actually. This is my final value. Okay. Now if I want to find out for A is equal to so much, okay, 26,000 kilometers, then even that can be done. Um, wherein uh, the value wouldn't be given for uh, T, okay. So you can actually uh, interchange them, okay. And you can take this side A, you can bring it down. Mu value is anyway there okay so you can get the value of n and uh, and finally find out so ultimately you will have to use the values which are present okay just just check for options okay as to what values are given and accordingly you can solve so we saw this problem also yesterday okay so we even saw this problem Fine. So today we will we will continue our discussion and we will see as to how we are going to calculate uh, for the satellite in the previous problem the, the new values. Okay, we are we are giving new values for one period after epoch. Okay, and uh, P A. Okay, we are going to use as a point uh, zero seven per day. So uh, new values for omega is going to be. 113 and uh, 251 respectively okay because we have completed one revolution from perigee to perigee okay so let's see the so it is connecting to this problem okay wherein in yesterday uh, yesterday's uh, class we had discussed uh, with the following parameters k is equal to so much and the angle of inclination is about 98 degrees okay so using these uh, parameters we will be continuing the next problem also so we have for the rate change right with respect to time uh, which is rate of regression will be about 0.98 degrees per day and the rate of rotation okay will be about minus 2 so keep in mind for regression we have used cos and for uh, rotation we will be using sine okay so these values to be kept in mind so the problem Problem here is going to be the continuation, okay, wherein uh, values of omega naught and uh, you know uh, is given. Since the satellite has completed one revolution from perigee to perigee, now what is a perigee? It is the closest point, isn't it? And uh, the apogee is the most distant point. So we have these formulas, right? We have this formula. So simply we will just be substituting okay these values 251.5 will be taken uh, plus okay uh, these values are taken from the previous problem t omega by dt okay uh, which is about 0.98 here and t minus t naught okay this is also taken so ultimately here what you should understand is uh, we are going to use the standard formulas and the problems are very simple here just that you want you have to know how to substitute values you have to just know the formula proper formula and accordingly you can uh, substitute now keep in mind okay you will be uh, needing the values of k you will be needing the values of i because only then you can find out the omega by dt 
okay and uh, you can find out the rate of regression and rate of rotation both of these values can be found out um, if in case they tell you to assume few missing data then you can you can assume or you can take any of uh, the data uh, you can put in the answer script as let's assume k is equal to so much or angle of inclination is equal to so much so if the question mentions assume missing data then you are free to assume any data and accordingly use them for your calculations right okay now in addition to the equatorial bulge okay, equatorial bulge the earth is not perfectly circular in the equatorial plane so what is an equator it is a line which is connecting uh, the both the ends okay now uh, if we divide the earth exactly into half uh, it has a small eccentricity of the order of n raised to minus 5 this is referred as equatorial electricity the effect of equatorial electricity is set up uh, is to set up the gravity gradient now why do we need this gravity gradient remember as i told you in my previous classes gravity plays a very important role how does it play an important role because it tries to keep the satellite in place and based on this uh, gravitational pull we actually measure uh, the values and uh, we can calculate values as to how much of maneuvering maneuvering pressure to be needed to keep the satellite in place say suddenly if the gravity drops okay then we will have to use extra fuel okay extra battery to bring the satellite in place so it is all calibrated all things are calibrated based on the gravitational pull now this gravitational pull is also um, you know influenced by the full moon half moon okay no moon and uh, the solar effects all these comes into picture this resulting okay which uh, is nothing but your equatorial electricity causes the satellites in geostationary orbit to drift okay so the gravity gradient is one such important tool which keeps the satellite in place okay. if not there is a drift that happens okay so if there is a drift then there's no point you know in actually maintaining a satellite satellites in service are prevented from drifting very important point satellites in service are prevented from drifting so which means those satellites which we do not want okay which we do not want to use will actually be left to drift away so if we just leave the satellite to drift away it means we are sending them to graveyards okay those are called satellite graveyards and uh, from drifting to these points through station keeping maneuvers okay so we will have the base station which actually has a proper control okay it will track the satellites and it will have a proper control and it will we can either move it to the left right top bottom anyway okay? because old out of service satellites eventually do drift to these points they are referred to as satellite graveyards and this is what i was talking about if we leave those satellites okay out or those satellites which are out of service we do not want to take the service of those satellites we will just leave them to drift away so if they drift away then it means that we have sent them to graveyards it may be noted that the effect of equatorial electricity is negligible on most satellite orbits now the important uh, factor here is atmosphere i remember i spoke about the harsh atmosphere and the solar flares okay, the solar winds that can actually hamper your satellite okay now these satellites are prone to extreme weathers okay either it can be too hot or it can be too cold so because of these extreme weathers uh, satellites are built in such a way that they can withstand all these effects for those satellites which are near earth okay about thousand kilometers 
the effects of atmospheric drag is significant. Now, what is this drag? It is nothing but when the satellite is in movement, the friction that happens due to the atmosphere is nothing but called your atmospheric drag. Because the drag is greatest at the perigee. Why is it greatest at the perigee? Can someone tell me? Why is the drag greatest at the perigee? You can unmute and respond. Now we have the drag. Now you all know what is a drag, right? And you all know what is a perigee. So accordingly, now I want you to answer why is it more at the perigee? Sandhya. Or anybody, anybody can answer it. Mm -hmm. So because of uh, density. Okay, why? Can you explain your answer? Like, uh, like uh, mm -hmm. the altitude, the mm -hmm. density increases. Oh, no, no, it decreases. Mm -hmm. so, so the drag reduces it. Okay. Now, what is a perigee? Thank you, Kishan. Now, what is a perigee? It is the closest point, right? Now, since it is close, now remember, we also have um, a gravitational pull, right? Now, because of this gravitational pull, there is a drag that happens, okay? Because it is closest to the Earth. And when, when I say it's closest to the Earth, it's also closest to the Moon, right? So, that is how the drag actually is greater at the perigee and it's less at the apogee because that's the most distant point it is away from the earth okay this drag acts to reduce the velocity of this point so velocity is reduced which means um, the time taken to travel okay is reduced because of this drag it has to forego this gravitational pull and have some extra energy um, you know to start moving with the result the satellite does not reach the same apogee height on successive revolutions so what do you understand by this statement now let us say we have a coordinate fixed okay for an apogee now let us uh, get back to that diagram which has the apogee and the perigee. Okay, so let us consider this diagram. Okay. Now in the first, now this is our OG point, okay, and this is our perigee point, okay, fine. Now that we have the points, uh, let's move on to the satellite. So our, see our satellite has started moving, okay, started moving maybe at, at the first revolution it might pass through that apogee point okay and then it might pass through the perigee point the next time due to the atmospheric track okay there can be a slight change in the path so because of the slight change in path it might just go close to the apogee point but not exactly on the same point okay so this difference is what I'm talking about okay so this difference from the first path okay to the, to the second path is what I'm talking about okay? 
so as your satellite keeps moving on okay it might take certain different other paths so let's say the third time it goes it might go to another level okay and probably cross here so this is how your satellite moves okay it will not be um, in the same path just like you know how we have straight roads it's not going to happen there I hope you understood the meaning of the statement. Right. Okay. So, because of this, the satellite does not reach the same apogee height on successive revolutions. The result is that the semi major axis and eccentricity are both reduced. Why is it reduced? Because they both are dependent on. Uh, the coordinates of apogee and peri. Now this is our expression, okay, where you can actually calculate how uh, for your major axis, okay, approximately, approximately this is how you can calculate. Okay, fine. Uh, where the zero is actually denoting the reference to time t naught. So at every instant of time, the satellite keeps moving from one point to another point. At T naught, maybe it was at one point. At T one, it goes to another point. Right. So as time progresses, the the satellite also moves on from one point to another point. And here n is nothing but the first derivative of mean motion. So what is this mean motion? Say the first minute it went uh, at about thousand kilometers per hour. And the second minute it went about um, say 500 kilometers per hour okay so what i will do is i will add them both 1000 plus 500 divided by 2 okay so approximately i'm going to take it as about 750 kilometers an hour so this gives my mean motion so n is nothing but my mean motion i will average out the speed of the satellite for its revolutions done you know, with reference to apogee and perigee points right. okay now we have something called inclined orbits what are these inclined orbits now what is an orbit orbit is a path which actually um, which which actually you know attracts or we have a satellite which moves on the path so this is called an orbit now when i say inclined orbit okay it means that there is a slight tilt i think you all are aware that even our earth is slightly tilted right about its axis it's about 23 and a half degrees tilted right similarly even our satellites could be tilted and and it moves on in the orbit so this in total is called your inclined orbit a study of general situation of a satellite in an inclined elliptical orbit is complicated why is it complicated because we have to calculate the angle of inclination we have to calculate its velocity we have to calculate the atmospheric pressure we have to calculate the atmospheric drag many many things to that the inclination is also this is added so which means it's going to become a complex task for us to understand the orbit and how it revolves around a planet so we are adding complexity or the complexity gets added just because the angle of inclination there is an inclination okay fine so let's look into the next one the orbital elements which are known with reference to the plane of orbit are the position which is fixed or slowly varying in space but the location of the earth station is usually given in terms of local geographic coordinates right just like you know how we have this uh, plus codes i think you are aware of this plus codes when you have google maps okay you, you can pinpoint a location and then when you go to more options you will have a plus code so this code is unique for a particular location so this location is um, is tracked based on the um, coordinates uh, for that point okay for that location so similarly here in uh, our orbital uh, in our space what we do is we take stars as a reference sun uh, 
okay the extra the, the other planetary uh, objects as reference just like how we used uh, the constellations right similarly we use these constellations as our reference and um, I try to track as to if it's in place or out of place or having an, a kind of inclination or an angle created from the normal when I say normal uh, you know the 90 degree right okay rectangular uh, coordinate systems are generally used in calculations of satellite position and its speed or velocity in space rectangular coordinates remember we spoke about horizontal coordinates then circular coordinates then uh, vertical coordinates so similarly here we are going to use uh, something called rectangular coordinates each station uh, quantities of interest are azimuth and elevation angles okay so this azimuth and elevation angles are nothing but called look angles okay the reason why we call them as look angles is how the base station is looking at the satellite okay so that gives us an angle and since we are looking at the satellite it creates something called look angle okay so we are using look angles and range so these are important things so continuing uh, with our discussion of inclined orbits okay so today we will uh, discuss only about this inclined orbits and probably uh, we will see if we can try to touch on uh, tropical year uh, we, we can even have problems based on this yes on tropical year and side real time geostationary polar okay yeah still there are a lot of topics to be discussed on this module so, yeah. so let's get back to the inclined orbits Fine. In order to illustrate the method of calculation for elliptical inclined orbits, the problem of finding the Earth station look angles and range will be considered. So, look angles and range, these two are important parameters if I have to calculate my inclined orbits. Okay. Now, there are two main important things here, okay, two major coordinate transformations. So, number one is your satellite position. How is the satellite position in what position is it just like how we have coordinates here we have to pinpoint the position of a satellite and then the second one is satellite to earth station position vector so how is it positioned to the uh, base station or the earth station now this is nothing but your observatory stations okay or the control stations that we have at um, you know the planet earth so from here we will actually send the satellite and we will control them and uh, this uh, control mechanism is in our uh, base stations so these so let's look at the second one the problem of finding the earth station look angles and range will be considered in this so which is earth station either receives or transmits signal or controls the satellite which we have already seen so what is the position of the earth station with respect to satellite so it can change okay but the base station wouldn't change right the, your position of the satellite could change it might change as the earth rotates so earth station location in terms of geographical co coordinates may also change now what is happening here we have a complex problem the earth is also rotating it is also revolving and the satellite is also in motion so we have to track or we have to come to a point where we can calculate the look angle and the range so since all three are in motion what are those three the satellites uh, position is also in movement the earth's rotation is also going on it's an ongoing process and the earth's revolution also goes on right so it's actually a complex task in in pinpointing the look angle and range of a satellite so ultimately you should know that these two points one is the position of the satellite and the vector towards the base station these two are main things which will be used as 
coordinates just like if you have three satellites okay you can pinpoint the location in your map it can use more than three satellites it can use more than three points x y and z minimum requirement is three points so if i have three points i can pinpoint a particular location okay so similarly here i will be using two coordinates one is the position and what vector it's actually drawing to the earth station so look angle will be used to check whether the satellite is receiving signals properly or not now the question is asked why is look angle so important okay you can probably think of uh, your uh, antennas okay the dish antennas which you are currently using for your dth right um, randomly the the executive doesn't come and just position it in some other direction in whichever direction he wishes to right but instead he will have an instrument which will actually track or check if the signal is going beyond 90 percent and above right so he will position the the disk in such a way that it, it receives maximum signal from the satellite okay so that's the important of look angle look angle will be used to check whether the satellite is receiving signals properly or not so if the look angle varies okay then your receiving signal also changes it might lose signals or it might um, receive degraded signals so the earth is rotating and the earth station is changing its position with respect to the satellite which you have already seen next how is range important the footprint is the ground area which receives the signal from the satellite and determines the satellite dish parameter required to receive the signal just like how we saw what range okay what is the distance and in what way it's looking into the satellite is nothing that you are looking at so what do we understand with all these discussions so far we understand that two important parameters are important are to be uh, looked upon first one is the range and the other one is the look angle So with inclined orbits, the satellites are not geostationary. Why is it not geostationary? Because it's inclined at a particular angle and when it starts moving, it can drift away from its path. Okay. So it cannot be uh, geostationary. And hence the required look angles and range will change with time. Now you all know what's a geostationary satellite, right? It looks constant, um, just like as if you know there's no movement but here this doesn't happen because of the error because of the incline inclination that has happened in its original orbit okay now why can this or how will this inclination happen uh, this is because of your atmospheric drag uh, because of uh, various external uh, parameters that can kick in right so how can we determine the look angles and range and what quantities to consider so the first one is orbital elements what are these orbital elements let's go back to kepler's laws of motion we have seen a lot of orbital elements there right these are your orbital elements these six parameters are your orbital elements so these actually play an important role in identifying the position, in identifying the range of a satellite. Right. Then various, various measures of time. Now time is important. Time, because of time, okay, with reference to time, we calculate how the satellite moves from one point to another point right so a calendar is a timekeeping device in which the year is divided into months weeks and days i think we are very much aware of this calendar days are units of time based on earth's motion related to the sun now we have created calendar just like how we say we have 365 and quarter days in a year 
right and uh, every four years we get an extra day so this quarter gets added up right 0.25 gets added up and we get an extra day in February so all this is done with reference to Sun okay. it is convenient to think the Sun I uh, think of Sun moving relative to Earth the motion is not uniform and so mean Sun term is introduced so always taking the mean keeps us safe now I have told you previously what is mean first path the speed might be different second path the speed could be different so if I take if I average them out that becomes my mean okay and uh, we will see one by one as to what is a tropical year and uh, how to calculate okay so just we will have an introduction to tropical year tropical year or we can even call it as a solar year is the time now questions can be asked write a short note on tropical year or problems could be asked based on use tropical year and calculate these values tropical year solar or solar year is the time that the sun takes to return to the same position in the cycle of seasons as seen on earth so what are those seasons we have summer we have winter we have rainy season right and we have spring so these four seasons okay the mean sun does move at a uniform speed but otherwise requires the same time as the real sun to complete one orbit of the earth this time being a tropical year Okay, we call it a solar year or a tropical year because we assume that the mean sun does move at a uniform speed or same speed sometimes assumptions are done and that's important a day is measured relative to this mean sun and it is termed as mean solar day so one day with reference to sun is called solar day calendar days are mean solar days okay, which means the average average with respect to sun right so as i told you um, we have 365 point uh, under quarter so it's not quarter it is 0.2422 okay, so each year contains these many days and a civil year okay which means our year that we normally use uh, will have only 365 days and this 0.2422 gets added up um, after every four years okay so but the extra 0.2422 of a day is significant and after thousand years there will be a discrepancy of 24 days it is just like you are multiplying with a thousand okay and uh, you find that there is a discrepancy of 24 days between the calendar year and the tropical year that is because of this minute decimal okay so as the years pass by okay um, if, we, if we take it for about 100 years then okay we are losing about 24 days okay so there is going to be a discrepancy in the calendar year and in the tropical year okay tropical year is actually 365.24 but calendar year is what calendar year is about 365 okay so there were a lot of attempts made by uh, various uh, uh, astronomers various scientists okay who actually wanted to make this or nullify this to zero julius caesar made the first attempt to correct the discrepancy what discrepancy the change or the difference of these 24 days that is happening okay made the first attempt to correct the discrepancy by introducing something called leap year okay in which an extra day is added in february okay whenever the year number is divisible by four so which means four eight uh, 12 16 20 so whichever number is divisible by four we add one extra day in the month of february so this was introduced by Julius Caesar so the calendar that we are using now is Julian calendar okay this gave us something called Julian calendar in which the civil year was 365.25 okay so 
but still you know it, it's an approximate now 2422 is not equal to 0.25 okay so still there is um, you know a lot of discrepancy but not as these this discrepancy that we saw here which is causing about 24 days of difference between the tropical and the civil calendar so a reasonable approximation was done to a tropical year okay so uh, i think we will we will see this one as well as to you know what happened yeah from here we will see in the next class this will be our last slide okay so in in 1582 okay so what happened an appreciable uh, discrepancy again existed between the civil and the tropical year now what is civil civil is actually having 365.25 and tropical is having 365.2422 okay that's important so in 1562 they observed a lot of discrepancy and uh, we had pope who actually took the matters in hand because at that point of time Pope was in charge okay and uh, he was controlling the world so so whatever decisions whatever uh, rules uh, were to be implemented it was only uh, to be done through Pope so Pope took uh, this into his hands and uh, in October okay so what he did was uh, a major thing happened okay he took matters and uh, he abolished the days between october 5 and october 14 uh, in 1582 so if you actually you know get to look at the calendar uh, of the year 1582 okay you will not find october 5 to october 14 okay these days were abolished from the calendar so why was this done because there was a lot of discrepancy okay that happened uh, in the year 1582 so in order to get this uh, rectified okay he abolishes these days between 5 to 14 so 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 so 10 days were eliminated in 1582 okay by placing an additional constraint on the leap years ending in two zeros must be divisible by 400 without reminder to be reckoned as leap years so again another you know parameter came in where he told if it is divisible by 400 okay and the remainder should be zero this dodge was used to miss out three days every 400 years so by this method what happened was we were just losing out only three days for every 400 passing 400 years okay so this calendar was called as gregorian calendar because the second name or the last name of pope is gregory so it was called as gregorian calendar and this is the one actually we are using uh, these days so previously before 1582 we were using julian calendar and right now we are using the gregorian calendar which actually uh, misses out about just three days for a massive 400 years so now you know probably in the upcoming classes we will see uh, you know there can be problems like this calculating and using this calendar how many days are lost how many days are there okay all these we will be seeing in the upcoming classes okay so i think all of you have understood uh, concepts uh, discussed so far okay and uh, and we will see these problems in the upcoming classes okay